Hi, I'm Eric Light, and you're Inside Corleone. Hello and welcome to Corleone Inside. My name is Eric Light. I'm the artistic director of Corleone Men's Square, the fabulous group, fabulous people here in Vancouver, British Columbia, and uh, excited to share some of their music with you today, as well as talk to our guest, Jacob Perry, who will be singing with the aforementioned Corleone. Uh, with us in May at our Van Man Choral Summit, uh, along with our My Voice program, etc., etc. It's going to be a great, great, great time. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to play a piece of music uh, performed by Corleone at the Chance Center, where the Van Man Choral Summit's happening. And this was uh, uh, recorded a few years ago. It is a Quebecois folk song arranged by BC's own Stephen Hatfield. And it is a real barn burner of a piece. Uh, not only does the song go by uh, really, really, really quickly, but uh, the way that Stephen Hatfield has arranged this, we have uh, multiple groups clapping, stomping, um, polyphony. He's like it really thrown the kitchen sink into this piece that lasts about two minutes. Uh, it's been one of our favorites, and it is called Oh Yo Yo. Performing it was a lot of fun because, especially once we had done a, a couple years worth of uh, runs on it and performances of it, uh, you really get the sense of the call and response within the choir and singing back and forth between um, the two different voices that are, are going on, the call and the response. Um, and you, you can see some of um, uh, us kind of almost kibitzing back and forth um, with, uh, with each other within the choir and, and sort of really just having fun with it. Uh, and I think that really plays into the, the life and energy in uh, Oh Yo-Yo. I have very fond memories of performing Oh Yo-Yo when we were on tour to Bali and Singapore. 
and especially the almost rivalry that developed between myself and the other guys doing the hand percussion to see who could make the least amount of stakes every time we performed it. So I think I won most of the time, but uh, I bet Kyle and Greg especially would challenge that notion. I am so excited to welcome to the show today our very special guest, tenor Jacob Perry. Hi, Jacob. Hey, Eric. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy uh, to, to speak with you, um, get a little bit caught up on some of the things that you've been doing, some of your perspectives here, as well as talk a little bit about what we're all going to be up to in May when you come out to Vancouver. So before we get into this, I, like, I'm, I'm, I've been very curious. I've been talking to folks here and there. What are you listening to these days? What's on the playlist? Oh, man. Um, that's... That, that's a wild question because it varies so day to day. Yeah. Um, it's been a lot of pandemic nostalgia, you know, oh. going back to things that from your childhood, just from, you know, for me, it's like the late 90s, early 2000s music that was sort of name names, adolescent name formation. names. You got to name names. Oh, well, you know, uh, <laughs> just people like people like Pink and people like, uh, for, well, actually, I guess when I think about uh my high school days, I think about Lady Gaga and, and just rediscovering some stuff that I just hadn't thrown on the radio in a long time. Got it. And it also, you're driving home how much younger you are than I am when you say Lady Gaga and high school together. So my nostalgia goes back. <clears throat> yeah. It, <laughs> it's literally played on the oldies stations. Yes. I've been, I've been having oh. a lot of eighties synth pop. Let's just say that's, that's, well, I that's did, been I my, did... yeah. I, I just turned 30 on February 3rd, so okay. I officially am starting to hear uh, the youngins refer to my music uh, <laughs> as throwback music. I've just been made aware that it's throwback, so uh, I, I'm that, feeling the age coming on. That 90s early aught stuff is really coming back in fashion. So, it, it, yeah. yeah, I mean, way the to jean be cool. jackets, all of it, it's coming mm -hmm. back. Yep, that's 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 fantastic. Uh, <laughs> first of all, tell us where you're uh, talking to us from. Where, do, where are you living? I days? am... Uh, talking to you from my childhood home, uh, which I'm currently like in the process of purchasing for my family. Oh, very um, cool. Yeah, I, I was born and raised in Silver Spring, Maryland, and yeah, that's where I am right now. My husband that's and good. I just uh, moved in in uh, July. Yeah, so it's Congratulations. Not, not even been a full year yet. But... Congratulations. That's uh, that's 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 very exciting. Um, uh, t so you're back to your childhood home. Tell us about that childhood. How did singing get into your life? <sighs> um, well, first as a, as kind of a joke, actually, my uh, aunt Maria, who I love so dearly, um, she put uh, it as a joke to my mom and dad that I would go as at four years old. I was already starting to sing and um, mimic some things that I was seeing in the VHS tapes that we that we know and love. Um, speaking of throwbacks, we should just make this whole. I, I wore that wrong outfit. Yeah. We should have just been thrown back in the in the clothes too. But anyway, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I know. I'm yeah. rethinking everything. Now. <laughs> um, but uh, there was this audition for uh, there was a dinner theater in Towson putting on a production of some i'm not even sure if this was authorized by disney winnie the pooh so, some kind of winnie the pooh play okay um, and just as a joke uh i guess or as a as a throwaway my parents took me to go do this audition and it was my ended up being my first paid gig was at four years old as a little uh white rabbit in uh <laughs> in some knockoff Winnie the Pooh spectacle in Towson, Maryland. <laughs> we all start somewhere, don't we? We do. <laughs> we really do. Um, yeah. And then from there, I basically was uh, brought up on classical uh, musical theater, classic musical theater, I should say. Sure. Um, Rodgers like and Hammerstein. Rodgers and Hammerstein, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, we sang... Um, the entirety of Les Mis every time we went on a road trip with the, with the parents and um, on the cassette tapes, uh, just everything is nostalgia right now for me. I'm just thinking about all these, <laughs> these wonderful, colorful analog technologies that we don't use anymore. And thinking right. back, mm, the good old days, those tapes, those cassettes, <laughs> those tapes. 
<laughs> They're coming back too. Anyway, uh, so your your family was your family terribly musical or just enjoyed that um, or both? Yeah. Both of my parents dabbled in music. Um, mm-hmm. I actually my dad went on to because I, I went on to do a lot of musical theater when I was a kid. Um, some of it in little regional pro uh, theaters and some of it in some community theater. And my dad actually performed a role alongside me uh, in a couple of musicals that I did in uh, Laurel Community Theater. And it was so not his personality or inclination. I mean, there's there's a lot of ways that my parents proved that um, they loved me so much and did not have even the slightest doubt that I was going to become a performer and that I was going wow. to go on to be a professional musician. And I know this now with in hindsight because of the amount of extra money that they didn't necessarily have and extra mm-hmm. time that they did not necessarily have that they put into driving and sitting out in parking lots while I was rehearsing and um, basically, basically making sure that if I wanted to be a part of a production and learn something um, and develop myself as an artist at a very young age, that was the thing that they weren't going to let there be any obstacles to yeah. that. Um and, and I feel incredibly grateful for that every day. And especially as I get a little older and I can look back and drive to, uh, you know, Annapolis right now from where I'm currently living in my childhood home and realize, oh, my God, they drove this twice a week sometimes right. or m- multiple times and sat out in the parking lot for hours and, and made um, a lot of huge sacrifices to uh, make sure that I got my formation as as an artist which really was um, now that we're talking about in musical theater i really still to this day identify as a a storyteller in a in a stage sort of context who uh, later in life sort of fell uh, by happy accident into um, kind of an early music specialty but in a a consort singing um, path so that's my literally my next question. How the <laughs> heck do you get from being a bunny in Winnie the Pooh <laughs> and singing all of Les Mis in the car to uh, to to singing um, Monteverdi Vespers? Um, well, I'll I'll sum it up by saying um, the answer to that question for me is actually what it ties into really nicely. Um, what I think is so important about this project that we're about to undertake in in May, which is mentorship meant everything to me as a kid. Um, And proximity to working, creative professionals that treated me like I was working alongside them and could, could fail, but also could learn. Like I wasn't some, I wasn't dismissed as a kid um, that wasn't going to understand these are the these are the building blocks for how you make um, something compelling. This is these are the building blocks of how we work on our instruments, how we yeah. treat and talk about ourselves as as artists. Um, and that was really, really strong. The, the mentorship that I got as a kid in this specific context of, of musical theater. And then at the end of high school, um, more and more in choral music and a little bit in, in jazz um and then really i I went to college um at at university of maryland baltimore uh, county and i had some terrific um vocal faculty there um, including two uh, professors that i studied under dr stephen carciolo and uh, janice jackson um who opened up my mind in terms of uh, how to think about telling stories with my voice because in musical theater, it was, it was, I got the storytelling and then you approach, how do you make your voice and how do you make the music, you know, sort of work after theater is the, is the emphasis. And at right. college, I got the, how do we build up our instrument and make beautiful, uh, profound music that also tells a story. And I really got that. From it's kind of two, yeah. It, it's it, two trains uh, crossing in the opposite right, direction. Right. Exactly. Or, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was. It was. It was building both sides of the muscle. You know, having chest day and back day. You know. <laughs> <laughs> got to do the legs. I, yeah. 
<laughs> I've just gotten into doing some strength training, so all of my metaphors now are about um, different. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to see how jacked you're going to be when you, you know, arrive well, in, uh... in May. I'm trying to. The goal is to get an old tuxedo to fit by May. That's that's currently the. Oh, amen, brother. Like I think we've all been there. <laughs> I think we've all been there. Uh, thank you, thank you, COVID. Um, uh, that's... Well, and so I let's. I, I, I want to get back into this, but I want folks to hear a little bit of this storytelling. And my goodness, the 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 piece that we're that this that this uh, excerpt comes from is honestly one of the more theatrical pieces uh, that is out there. Uh, the the Monteverdi Vespers. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, for those that don't know what uh, what the Vespers are, and then what this piece is that you're singing here, Nigur Sum. Um, well, the Vespers is a glorious uh, late. Well, I guess it's it's early Baroque or late. I'm, it's, I'm gonna... it's as as they say, it's a pivot piece. It, it is. Um, yeah. Instruments are just uh, starting to enter the church, uh, which previously was not a thing. We we get the glorious um, sackbuts and the wind instruments and the strings and all of these colors are uh, starting to not be uh, considered the devil and on the out, and we're really starting to see this new form of music. There's lots of incredible counterpoint and polyphony in, in Monteverdi's Vespers of 1610, but then there's also incredible um, homophonic work uh, in the choir, really declaiming um, text in new and exciting ways. Um, and yeah, this, this piece is uh, a particularly beautiful moment in the Vespers where kind of similar to uh, in Bach's B minor mass where the tenor steps out and there's light continuo and a flute. This is a similar moment in the Vespers of Monteverdi where it's just a continuo, in this case, the orbo and tenor um, having a moment of virtuosic um, showmanship and really sort of telling an intimate story. Yes, yeah, so singing uh, uh, the, the text from the Song of Songs, uh, Negro, so I'm, I am black, but I am comely. Uh, however, you want to translate that from uh, from the Latin. Uh, one of the, just the most glorious uh, moments in all of musicdom, and sung gorgeously by Jacob Perry. <laughs> Oh. Uh... 
That was Nigrasum from Monteverdi's Vespers of 1610. If you don't know this piece, it is a, it's kind of the whole universe encapsulated in one, a, a, the universe of music encapsulated in one piece. It's, uh, it's over the top, it's intimate, it's got, it's got it all. Uh, and it's literally, it's, uh, I think if there's a piece on my bucket list that I'd ever want to get to conduct, I still have not had the chance and that's on the list so that was gorgeous jacob thank you thank you <laughs> and so how does um let's talk about that 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 performance and that piece specifically so let's say you're wearing your musical theater hat from uh you know uh, or you're thinking about it in terms of that what what's from that back experience informs a performance on negrosum versus the things that you know that you need to do to be um respectful to the period and the style etc cetera, etc cetera. because sometimes i think those things can maybe you can go to one uh, too far one direction or the other yeah for sure um I appreciate the question because I think it comes uh, right at the heart of um, perhaps a difference of opinion, but perhaps not that some people will have about the performance, modern performance of, of early music. Um, and I, I still sort of, I feel self-conscious when I talk about it because despite how much of it that I do, there's an extent to which I still feel like an outsider to it in that um, I performed a ton of it, but I, I am generally speaking, performing alongside colleagues that have spent a lot more time um, getting into the, the graduate level work on historical performance practice. And I don't, I, I admittedly do not have that background, but what I have had is the privilege of working alongside some of those people um, and uh, gaining some of their wisdom in the process and learning from some of the the best recordings out there and learning from some of the, the people giving lectures on on style and then just following at the end of the day my own intuition um i think that following what sounds true to you and what makes sense in your instrument is always going to lead you to a better more compelling result for an audience than if you are trying to meticulously recreate something despite it not um, necessarily feeling true in that particular mm -hmm. moment um, and and that's not to say that there isn't uh, there's obviously incredible uh, amounts of research um, into historical performance practice that has developed in in me without me even realizing the generations of people before me that have been informing what I do um, so there's incredible value to it but at the end of the day when I go to approach interpreting a piece of music a lot of it has to come from what kind of breath am I breathing into this? What kind of images does this text conjure up that are going to inspire what kind of, you know, what kind of motion and movement? Because as you can see in this particular piece, the continuo, um, the, the theorbo is really, um, there, there, are, there are duetting partners uh, in a sense, these, these two um, instruments on this piece. Um, but in the same way, the, the the voice is having to be out there on its own and just to tell a story. So if I'm going to uh, do that effectively, I got to listen to my right. my intuition and listen to what my voice is telling me to, to do. Well, and so much music making is about the reconciliation between the head and the heart um, and uh, and maybe 
our responsibilities to the composer and our own intuitions and all that. I mean, that's the reconciliation that we have to make. That's that's artistry, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, uh, the the great uh, conductor, uh, Philip Brunel, once said to me, uh, I think we were at a party one time and he said, Eric, I think he was talking about conducting, but I think it could all be said for 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 music in general. Uh, music is one of the dark arts, and it is passed along from uh, from master to apprentice. And uh, uh, and I think that osmotic way of being around those people, other artists, other other uh, conductors, uh, those pe people that know th uh, things, what we're trying to create is intuitions within us, so that those can come out in natural organic and honest ways right and, and, absolutely yeah, and i think um i just think that performance of what you what you what you're doing there uh with nikrasum is is uh is really vital and it's 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 really fresh so thank you for that thank it's, you yeah, <laughs> i it's, appreciate uh, that. yeah it's it, it's it's terrific um i want to turn to um so a lot of what you're doing in terms of early music and and those sorts of things is um, there's also ensemble singing is a part of your life and that's happening in in a number of different ways. Um, first, how did you come to that? And then, how um, how is that? How did, how does that music making feel different maybe than when you are out singing um, solo? Oh man, um, I often say that it's so much better <laughs> I, uh, I agree I, there, there's you know there's obviously a soloist in me there's mm -hmm. obviously a performer with the capacity to step into that role as as needed um and i definitely need to uh help myself along that path and really push myself into doing that but there's no doubt in my mind that um i'm much more at ease on a stage immediately in a concert setting because of just that aspect of um, it's always teamwork in music, whether you're a soloist out front or not, but the sense that you're in an arc of singers or an arc of singers and, and instrumentalists, and you are all going to not just make it to the end, but make it through every little twist and turn. Some of this polyphony that, that I have sung over the years just makes my heart sing. Um, and part of that is, is that it feels very similar to the way that, um, the virtuosic jazz musicians must feel in that when you're with a group of people that are doing it and doing it well, it is an alive feeling and a, a living organism of music that you are responding to in new ways. You will be singing a line that you've probably sung with 12 different groups over the years and you will find something new in it that you've never found before when you're working in this manner and that's just something that um it, it keeps me it keeps me doing it in terms of your let's just talk maybe just your like with your vocalism versus your listening all all the rest of that what it um what are the things that you put maybe on your top two or three hierarchies of of when you're doing that ensemble singing of mm -hmm. a lot of conversations I've been having with the folks that are in the Leonids is talking about that difference between um, how do we assert ourselves as artists into the moment because you have to be there there has to be mm -hmm. you in in the picture and yet um, being a part of the whole and that and navigating the the ins and outs of of that what what are you thinking of when that's when that's working for you it's that's a really good question and i think that that has changed over the years for me um as i've developed more of what i think of as my style or my philosophy particularly of of polyphony um but i would say that a couple of core things is i think you're right to say to assert yourself or to to fully show up as a member or as an artist within the group especially if we're talking um one and apart singing which we often are in in this period <laughs> nowhere to hide there right yeah <laughs> no, nowhere nowhere to hide and and also nowhere to hide not just in terms of sitting back and playing it safe but sitting back and playing it safe often in my experience is coupled with sitting back and missing things and not not really being on the same page because you're, you're trying to hide. Um, and knowing that I 
will have worked with or none of these this roster of people that you've you've got together for this project there isn't a single one of them um that that runs and hides anywhere they're all no. <laughs> fantastic um and i'm so excited to be to be seen with them i think what i think of is if you are trying to um come into concert singing and make an outsized effort in influencing what's going on, then you're probably doing too much. Uh. Um, but the, the idea would be to have an open and fully aware self while it's going on. I think of it as a meditative state, really. Um, because then all kinds of things start happening in your breath and in your body and in your tone and in, the vowels that you choose to use that you're not really, it's, it's interesting. You're not really thinking about it, which is no. why I think I, um, I struggled to, to think of what do I think about in those moments? Cause I, I, when I'm doing it right, I feel like I'm not thinking it's, it's, um, almost like, you know, you've got a, a, a USB hub for your computer to plug all your dongles into, and you're really just plugging into something there. You're, you're not actively, um, trying to, mess with something or you're not you know too you're not checking out you're but you are plugging in fully with what what is going on and for me one of the things that's changed over the years is that i think i place a much higher emphasis on rhythm than i oh. than i once did in the sense that um in choral music there can be a tendency to get a little loosey-goosey with um, internal rhythmic integrity um, and to let dotted rhythms really luxuriate on, especially on high pitches where we're really sinking into um, our, our instruments and letting them f blossom into doing what they like to do. And that's not to say we shouldn't do that, but it, it does mean if you need some time in your voice to really s prepare that note, that you should, you need to get your preparation early. You got to, it's, it's about the rhythmic integrity and the pulse and the talk tos, never, ever messing with that. If you're because sight reading. It will, it will mess somebody else up yeah, exactly. in, in the grand scheme. Yeah. That's good for you. But that, that alto part that's coming in right after you in, you know, it, it, it won't, it won't work. Yeah, yeah exactly. In, in a, a fantastic colleague of mine, um, male soprano, Eric Brenner told me a while ago, um, years ago now, and it really, it stuck with me that you are so much more likely to screw up a colleague um, messing with the rhythm. Let's say if you're reading a piece of music for the first time, sing a wrong pitch, make up gibberish words, but Amen. don't mess with the rhythm Just because that is yeah. what will, that that's what will train wreck a, a piece of music. Is, is that you can, all kinds of funky chords can go by, oh, we're just singing, it's Jesualdo for a couple measures. Um, but mess with the rhythm, and that's when all, all heck can break loose. <laughs> and in polyphony, come in at the right time. So don't don't come in a beat late. It just, again, you'll go from, yeah, you'll go from Jusgan to Jesualdo. Yeah. <laughs> like that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this, this Leonid's project. Um, I didn't know you. Uh, you were you. You were one of the folks that were sort of recommended to me um, as of putting together this roster. And um, as I did with everyone, I just Google stalked uh, you. Uh, I, I I know everything about you. Social security number. Uh, all, oh, you know th those parking tickets. You should really get those parking tickets paid. You know, I thought um, that there were a couple <laughs> credit cards I didn't recognize. No, on yeah, you should talk to Visa. It's gotcha. not good. Um, but anyway, uh, we, uh, I, so I know, I know more about you than you know about yourself, uh, but we've not, we've not worked together. Um, but I, I had to sort of pitch you this idea of coming together for, you know, 10 days and, uh, making music, uh, in this, uh, this chamber music way. Uh, but with our focus really being about the, not only just what's going on with that nine voice group, but also about the collaborations with, with Corleone and our responsibility, as you were saying earlier, with mentorship, uh, like for our, for our educational programs, like my voice, um, d coming away from it now, and you you're coming here thinking about all of this in terms of the, let's just talk about maybe the impact or, uh, moments that you're sort of hope for. Are there, are there things that you're just, you're sort of 
itching to, to, or that you sort of hope are going to happen or you hope will be a takeaway when you, when you fly away from Vancouver and what you've left here? I think if I had to um, just put all of my hopes into one little um, package, it would be that, that someone or that as many people as possible um, that are participants in it, walk away feeling as though they've been empowered in some way by, by what we've done to make a decision, whether that's to pursue music more on a professional basis or not. Um, because again, it's not, it's not for everybody to necessarily make that, that kind of choice. And I feel per, just uh, insanely privileged um, and, and fortunate to have been able to make that choice. Um, right. But, but that's so much, that's only one aspect of, of what we're, hoping to do i think we're talking about you know having people's personalities come alive and realize that you can show up and be a part of a team and um really develop as a human being and make relationships and um figure out things about yourself in this process um i know i did i mean it, it just completely changed my life the opportunities that i had to see people doing something at a level that um, I wanted to be at and then to be able to do it with them. You know, and to have it at arm's reach. It's not this thing that's just on the stage. Like, I'm going to have lunch with this guy. It, like, yeah. it's, that, it's that, it, those are the, yeah, those are the sorts of opportunities that you want to sort of to, to take, to break down some of those walls that we may think are there. But in actuality, when we're all going to be singing together, I mean, there's going to be kids singing their very first concert on the chance stage are singing the exact same notes as you and we're doing that together and isn't that quite that 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 i never get over that of uh, like how how uh what an equalizer all of this is um in yeah. terms of uh, uh this this lifelong music making activity in whatever way that we allow this to be into our lives um and i love what you're saying um i think this the idea of empowerment in in like every aspect of this but that empowerment through a, a bit of that vulnerability is i think uh, if you can fuse those two things together then you've then you've done something that people walk away with not just in what they're going to do on in their choral world and their singing world but what they're going to be doing hopefully in their lives um and absolutely yeah, that's 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 it um I want to put you on the spot a little bit. You've had a chance to look at the the repertoire a bit, so you you do a lot of early music, um, and we have like almost none on this program. So, <laughs> as, are there any? Are there any? And that was very intentional on my part um, of the, of what I wanted, like who I wanted to try to bring in here, and like let's like here's what you do over here. Now you've come to Canada, you go across the border, and now I get to do a very, very, very different things. So I have some, a bunch of premieres and a lot of works that, um, well, frankly, you know, you certainly you've not sung, but nobody in the group has sung. Um, any standouts? Oh God, um, <laughs> I really, I mean, the the tango with God was uh, something that I, piece, I mean, yeah, I. Yeah. That is such a striking piece, and it, it stands out to me in my memory because, um, or just in, in my consciousness, because it's got such an interesting juxtaposition of text and tone. It's really, really fascinating, and I can't wait to feel what it feels like to be performing that, because just experiencing something as an audience member um, is a totally different uh, ball game than, than what it's like to actually perform a work like that. Um, the, the, you've, you've made an incredible program and there's, I'm sure there's tons of things that are just not, um, no, that's popping into my brain right now, obviously. Um, but also something I'm lo really looking forward to, uh, I've never sung in a TTBB choir before. This is going to be my first experience singing in an all male ensemble. Yeah. So that... I'm, I'm super thrilled to, to just feel again what that feels like and, live in those tone colors and live in that range and figure out what how expressive um that repertoire in that range can be so i'm i'm really excited to to figure that out that is really um uh well i'm i honestly i'm a little i'm a little shocked uh and that's 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 very 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 cool um i it yeah i think having lived a lot of my professional life in in those tbb ttbb ranges 
um, there are definitely um, uh, changes that we have to make in terms of how we're thinking about balancing, clarity, et cetera, et cetera, because our SATB stuff has, has all of this space inside of it. And what most composers do is take all of those same notes and squoosh them down and where our ears uh, sometimes struggle to hear it. So especially when I'm working with um, a large group like Corleone, trying to find those bits of clarity and all the rest of it. So yeah, it is, it is, um, it's, it's the same, but it's, it, it's different. Uh, there's just a, there's a few little tricks of the trade, uh, certainly that, um, that come along with the way. So, well, that'll be fun to explore. I, that I'm really together. looking forward to <laughs> learning really a lot about that experience because, uh, I think that'll be really rewarding. <laughs> that that is awesome. Uh, that there could be a first uh, there as well. Um, I want to play one more uh, piece uh, for the folks uh, here and uh, have you hear you singing in uh, in some ensemble work. And this also comes from a uh, a, a recording of you singing the Monteverdi Vespers. Uh, could you could you uh, set up this uh, this setting of Duo Seraphim? Um, it is a gorgeous. Again, it's re uh, reduced texture for the Vespers. It's interesting; these two these two yeah. selections of the Vespers are not indicative. Doesn't sound of like the, the rest of the, the piece. Yeah, the texture yeah. and the scope of of this huge piece with winds and strings and organ and it's incredible. Um, yeah, this sounds like Dowland or something. It's a like tight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we're, we're only showing the little chamber. Even. Exactly. <laughs> um, but it's it's sung it's performed by first two and then three tenors. It's got incredible, um, difficult written out ornamentation as you'll hear, um, and it uh, yeah it's just one of the most fun things to sing with with your tenor friends. And uh, uh, when you do a lot of early music like this, you start talking oh. Would it get your um, duo seraphim trios together? Oh, I, got, I found my tress soon. You'll know what that means if you if you go through the whole piece. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm a I'm a I'm a bass baritone. I would I don't I don't speak this language. I don't I know nothing of what you're talking about. But um, uh, it's it's a it's a gorgeous performance, Jacob. We cannot wait to have you here. Thank you so much for sharing um, this perspective. And I it just for me for sure and i hopefully for the folks that are coming and watching this um it just makes me so excited uh for the times that we'll share the experiences we'll have together and the music we're going to make so really 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 thank you thanks so much for having me i'm just overjoyed that we're going to have this this chance to do it so <laughs> after a long pandemic away so. we've we've earned it we have wait we have been very very patient so uh we have <laughs> earned it so uh this is jacob perry singing Duro Seraphim from the Monteverdi Vespers of 1610. <laughs>
That was Duo Seraphim from Monteverdi's Vespers of 1610. Jacob Perry singing. Uh, that is just some gorgeous music making. And uh, I got to say, I'm excited for him uh, to hear that voice that you just heard uh, singing a, a barn burner arrangement that we have of feeling good uh, when he's singing with us in the Leonids. Uh, I'm so excited that some of these guys that we've brought in uh, can can wear lots of different hats and styles of music. So that should be a, a really, really, really fun time. Uh, we'll be back in a week or so with another guest. And uh, until then, stay safe, be well, and we'll see you next time.